Hello, Story Talkers. It's Tess from State Library Victoria here today with Susan as well. Thank you, Susan, for signing with us. Today, we are going to be chatting to the author of this amazing book, The Orchard Underground. Today, we are chatting with Matt Larkin. Hello, Yay. Matt Larkin. Woo! Hello, Tess. Hello, world. Thank you for having me. <gasps> Thanks, Matt, for coming on Story Talks. And first, we have a question from young reader Ted. Hi Matt, I'm Ted. Why is your book called The Orchard Underground? My book, uh, well firstly an orchard is like a big group of trees that grows fruit, right? You can get apple trees and pear trees and things and that's an orchard. My town that the story takes place in is called Dunn's Orchard, but it has almost no trees. And the reason it has no trees is because it's been growing and as it grows, they keep demolishing and bulldozing all the trees and replacing it with houses and streets and stuff. So there's almost no green, wild, fun places to play anymore. And then one day, some kids realise there's only one bit left with anything green or tree in it and they go and explore it and behind it, they find a hidden valley that's not on the maps. And in the valley, they find a cliff on top of the cliff, they find a house under the house, they find a cave, and in that cave, they find, I'll give you a hint, something magical. Ooh. Spoiler in the title. <laughs> <laughs> something magical. Hmm. Matt, did you ever experience anything like this growing up? Well, I can't say I ever found an orchard underground, but I wanted to. I did grow up in a brand new sort of town right on the edge of Melbourne when I was growing up called Ringwood North. And that was, I was the first kid to live on the first house in the first street in a brand new suburb. And it was all green and paddocks. And I used to run around and chase horses and do all kinds of fun things. And then little by little, they demolished all the green stuff and made more suburb until I was in the middle of a suburb. The city came and grew around me. So my story kind of takes place in a version of the town that I grew up in, except with magic stuff added. Or is it magic? Maybe it's Ooh. magic. It's a little Ooh. bit a little bit magic, a little bit magic. Well, yeah, like we discussed, Dunn's Orchard is a bit of a cardboard cutout town. It's all a bit the same, nothing very exciting going on, but it's hiding something much more complex and mysterious. Mm. How do you build the worlds that you're writing about? Well, um, I start with, in my case, I started with a place where I grew up. And then I said, what if that, but more magical? So I made the place I grew up a bit more boring so the magic thing would look a bit more magic. Um, but also I had to find a place to put the magic thing. Now I could have put it in a house or in the middle of town or in pre the main character's own house or somewhere like that. But I decided to put it somewhere hard to get to beyond a forest. So they have to go through a scary forest in order to get to it. That makes mm -hmm. the story more interesting. Mm -hmm. And okay, now the forest is on the edge of town. So um, what else do I have to have in the town? A house for our characters to live in. Uh, I've got a suspicious mayor who's a bit evil. So I'll give him a big castle-like building right in the center of town. And because he wants to be so big, he doesn't want anyone else to have a big house. So maybe all the other houses are small. Okay, now I've got a town. Where else do people live? What else happens there? Is there a school? Is there um, shops? Is there, what else do you have? And it just grows and grows and grows. And as I write the story, I add more bits of town and eventually it gets very big. And it just lives inside your brain. And then as you're typing it out. Sort of, I drew a map and I'm oh, very bad at drawing maps, but uh, I used to be good at it and I've forgotten how to, but I've got this map that I drew where I can remind myself if I ever forget which street to have to go down to get to that forest or Pre's house or another bit of the town. It's good to remind yourself with drawings. Drawings are a good part of writing stories. Yeah, oh, that's so cool that you write maps. Otherwise you would get lost in the town of your own creation. And I do love the name of the coffee shop in your town. It's called Truly Enormous Coffees, which I think a lot of people could get on board with. <laughs> it's, a, it's a shop that adults go to to buy coffee and the coffees are so big. Have you ever noticed how big grown-ups coffees are? I know. Um, so I thought, I'll just call it. What if the coffee shop told the truth about itself and just said, we sell Truly Enormous Coffees? <laughs> So catchy. Um, so when the worlds are quite technical like yours, and we can't have any spoilers here, but they are quite technical worlds beyond Dun Dun's the Orchard, do you have to be an expert to create such a technical world? 
I think you can be as technical as you want. You can draw special maps. You can use rulers and tools and look things up and do special research. But I said before, I used to be good at drawing maps. I was better at creating worlds when I was a kid because mm -hmm. I didn't think uh, that would never really happen in the real world. I didn't yeah. care. I just drew whatever was a fun map for a fun story. And I think that's where you've got to start when you create a world for your stories. Think about what's fun. If someone read this story, would they have fun if they read it? And I put it in this world with lots of bizarre stuff in it. Um, so you could have an ordinary world, like my town is very ordinary, but then you hide amazing stuff in it. And that's your world that's got hidden stuff and cool stuff that your characters can discover. Oh, yeah, there was definitely some cool stuff hidden in this <clears> world. So your book has some surprising twists and turns for the reader. How do you keep track of everything that's going on? And do you ever lose track and forget what's happening? How dare you? No, I do. I lose <laughs> track all the time. <clears throat> I'm constantly thinking, oh, I forgot to put this character in for ages. And I really like that character. I better go and write them in. So there's a few things I do. I'll show you one, in fact. Yeah. When I think of a really good idea or a character or something that should go in a book, in the book, I write it down quickly on a piece of paper. I've got these cards that I use and I stick it on my wall. There's nothing here now because I'm writing a secret new book and I've taken it down so you can't get any spoilers. Ah. <laughs> I'll show you some that I wrote for the Orchard Underground. So yeah. Attica and Pre, my main characters, I just wrote one day, Attica and Pre hide under a half fallen tree, monster. I didn't know what that was going to be. I just thought it would be cool if they had to hide under a tree from a monster. And that is a scene in the book now. <laughs> the next one just says, and I love this one, robot caterpillar. I, just one day I went, wait, what about if there was a robot caterpillar? So I just made one of my characters have a robot caterpillar and it became one of the most important things in the whole book just because I thought it would be fun. Yes, and it then did play a very one. pivotal role in the story. <laughs> one last one. A sloth arrives, but not in the usual way. And when I wrote that, I thought, wait, what's the usual way for a sloth to arrive? <laughs> I don't know. But luckily, I didn't have to think of the usual way. I had to think of an unusual way. And one of the most famous bits that people like in my book is a sloth arriving in an unusual way in the middle of the story. It is a very unusual way for a sloth to arrive. I agree. I've got a quick second way to, to show you how I keep track of my characters. Do you want to Please see? Please do, yeah. Okay. For my next book, I've got lots of characters and I didn't know how to keep track of them all and, and remember them all at once. So I did this. I made Lego minifigures of uh, all my characters. And oh I my stuck goodness. Them on top of my computer monitor. And Ooh. now every time I write, I look at my characters and I remember them. It's the coolest thing I've ever done. And I want to do it for everything from now on. That is so cool. I think I'm going to use that for work so I can remember who I've promised to what and what I need to get done by. That's great. Maybe kids could do that at home for their teachers. Have to get this in for this Damn. Lego figure by tomorrow. Make your friends, make your teachers, make anyone up and put make yep. them in the Lego minifig. Oh, that's great. So, Matt, are you one of those writers who knows everything that's going to happen when you start a book or do you kind of let the story guide you? Oh, that's such a good question. Some people like to know all the events of the story, like they've got it all written down on things like my cards, and then they just write the whole thing out. And they know right at the start what the ending's going to be. Some people just make it up as they go. I'm in the middle. So what I like to do is I knew that at the end of my book, my main character, Pre, would have a very important decision to make. Mm -hmm. There was a lever Pre. that I would put in his hand. There's Pre. I put a lever in his hand that if he pulled it, something would be destroyed and something would be saved. If he didn't pull it, the thing that would be destroyed would be saved and the thing that would be saved would be destroyed instead. He has to pull the lever and he has to make a decision right now. I didn't know what choice he was going to make. I didn't know whether he would pull the lever or not pull the lever until I actually wrote that scene. And I wrote myself right up to it and I wrote him thinking about whether he'll pull it or not. And that was the moment when I knew what he would do. And the whole book changes after that. It changes the whole ending. But I always knew he would have to make the choice, but I didn't know what choice he would make. Whoa, that's amazing. Writing right into a point and then just letting it go, take itself from there. I felt like I knew Pre well enough to let him just choose. Oh, that's great. Well, Matt, we have a bit of a writing activity for everyone watching and, and you're going to guide us through it. So tell us, what is it called? Well, 
this first one is called I can't remember. <laughs> it is called Too Real, One Fake. Oh, Too Real, One Fake. Too it's real, one of fake. my favourite games to play. I play this game with my son all the time. Yeah. It's a game where you tell a story about a day that you had once, something that happened to you. Yeah. And you have three things that happen in the story. Two of the things are real and definitely happened to you. But the third thing is made up, 100% made up. And the trick is your friends have got to guess which one is the made up story and which, mm. which event is, which two events are real. And to trick them, you make the two true events sound a bit story, a bit fake, and you make the fake one sound as real as possible. Ah, uh, okay. Want to play? Yeah, yes, please. All right, I'll think of one. Um, okay. So here's a story that really happened to me. Two of the things that happened are real. One mm. of them is made up. Mm. One time, I was a contestant on a TV game show. Here's fact number one. I lost the game show by one question because I was so nervous I forgot the word for slippers. <laughs> fact number two, after I lost, I went and bought a big messy sandwich and it fell right in my lap in front of the host of the TV show and he laughed at me. <laughs> That's fact number two. <clears throat> fact number three, Later, when I was leaving, I saw the game show host trip and fall on his face, and the thing he tripped over was a pair of slippers. <laughs> I was doing it. So, three facts. Okay. Which one of those? Two of them are real. One of them is not real. Which one is the not real one? They all sound completely bonkers, but I'm going to have to say the not real one is the TV host falling over a pair of slippers. You guessed it. That's yes. the one that's not true. He didn't ah. do that. In fact, I didn't see him ever again and he just got to laugh at me with a sandwich down my front. <laughs> but the fact that you forgot the word for slippers and that you spilt a sandwich all over you in front of the TV host, is that's fairly incredible. What a good day. Uh, that, was, yeah, that was an interesting day for sure. <laughs> so this is a good game to play if you want to get the creative juices flowing, isn't it? Yes, it's a good way to mix up your real life and stories. So you can make your real life sound like a story and you can make your story sound like real life. So playing that game with your friends, and you can do it writing down or you can just do it talking, it makes for a really great way to make stories out of your real life. Yeah, and it's good to be able to play around with stories and have a bit of fun before you sit down and write, and that's how the good ideas get going in the old noggin. Well, well thank I you. Thank you for sharing that, Matt, and we will be back in our next video. Stick around, we are going to discover our inner weirdo. Woohoo! That'll be fun. See you then.